the future of retail Asia with Jun and Imran, powered by AI Amazing. Hi, I'm Imran, Head of Marketing of AI Amazing. Hi, I'm Jun, uh, CEO of AI Amazing. Welcome to the first episode of The Future of Retail Asia. Today, we have Mr. Lim Ming Yan, the Chairman of Singapore Business Federation. Uh, in his previous roles, he was 22 years with Capital Land uh, Limited, uh, his last position being uh, President and Group CEO from 2013 to 2018. Ming Yan, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. So yeah. I think Jun, over to you, first question. Once again, I think it's our pleasure to have Ming Yan with us today. Uh, I think just now Imran mentioned about, right, it's like uh, Ming Yan, you spent about uh, 22 years with one of the Asia biggest landlord, uh, Capital Land. And now you are the chairman of the Singapore Business Federation. Right? So I think you have the experience representing both sides, uh, the merchant and the landlord. So it looks like there's some uh, fraction or rather than tension right, between both parties. And why, I think, I think a lot of people are curious about like, why they can't find a common ground. And why do you think this is the case? Okay, I, yeah. I think first of all, uh, uh, I just want to mention that uh, it is not quite true that there's a lot of uh, fractions within the group. There are some tension, no doubt, uh, because you are always on, uh, on different side of the negotiating table. But at the end, when you look at it carefully, mm. uh, both mm. landlord and retailers must come together. Mm. They must come together in order to create the whole eco retail ecosystem yep. to allow yep. basically the marketplace to be thriving to allow the, the, the retailers to be able to sell more and to be able to attract the customers to come into the retail more. So I think that's the, a, a very symbiotic uh, kind of relationship between uh, landlord and tenants. So the tension is in a way inevitable because you are always negotiating with each other about what is the right uh, and fair yeah. arrangement between uh, both parties. And uh, at the end of the day, as in many of the marketplaces, is decided by the market forces. So mm. uh, I think this is where um, it is. But then it's always useful for both parties to come together and talk mm. and to better understand each other. And this is already happening. I think under uh, SBF, uh, we have uh, promoted what we call the Fair Tenancy Framework. Yes. And this was only set up only very recently. Uh, to essentially get land, landlord as well as uh, the retailers to come together and by having a platform to communicate with each other to also decide that what is the right so-called code of uh, conduct within that framework. So having done that, I think now we, uh, we, I see a lot more of a collaboration between uh, landlord as well as uh, tenants. Mm. And uh, in the current environment, I think with the pandemic, with COVID-19, I think the people, obviously businesses are affected. And uh, I see now both landlord and tenants coming together and to, in a way, help each other to overcome the, the adversity that we are facing at this point in time. And this is, without that communication platform, it's actually very hard for it to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm pleased that uh, it's already happening. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for sharing. So you, you shared about uh, having the Tenancy Act and you actually shared about this symbiotic relationship right, between tenant and the landlord that we, we cannot mm. live without each other. Um, so to, to what extent can uh, this mediation or a, a fair tenancy agreement, like, uh, and actually as part of this uh, agreement, if I'm not wrong, data transparency is one of the key elements to kind of like build a, a bridge mm. of trust mm. as well. Right? So like, do these solve the problems? Um, that, uh, that yeah, we're facing yeah. today? I, I think it does. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, uh, when we make decisions, we make decisions out of, uh, based on uh, uh, data, uh, what we call a data-driven approach to mm -hmm. decision-making. Yep. And uh, obviously, to, to, in order to have that data transparency between the landlords as well as uh, tenants, uh, both parties must get together and uh, be prepared to share uh, data mm -hmm. Uh, I think the, the, the format in which how this could be shared uh, can always be discussed so that uh, from the business angle, there's no confidential so-called business information that will be leaked out. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't affect your competitiveness, but at the same time, it allows 
uh, effective and data-driven decision making mm. and uh, mm. dis- discussion. So it's important because uh, if businesses are affected, let's say by COVID, you want to know that uh, to what extent it has been affected mm. and to what extent that uh, they say, for example, for landlord to be able to step in to help and even for to the some extent to for the government to think about how they can support some of these businesses to tie over a very unusual uh, situation. So, so these are the kind of uh, information that we are looking at mm-hmm. uh, to <coughs> allow essentially both parties to base their discussion and negotiation and, and uh, maybe negotiation on, on something that is uh, the, the reality on the ground rather mm-hmm. than based on the perception of individual or anecdotal evidence. Mm-hmm. But from us, right, I think when we look at online today, I think yeah. when the online can grow so fast, is it like because uh, when the merchant have the outlets or have a, they're selling things on Lazada, Shopee or mm. Amazon, right? Mm. Actually, the platform is able to get all the transaction data and then the platform will using this data to actually help the merchant to grow their sales, right? So, but when we look at the mm. physical retail, especially like shopping mall, mm. and then we keep, we uh, keep, uh, hearing about like a lot of uh, more management will be facing some issue to getting the data from the tenants. So just now I think we mentioned about trust. So is it like this data transparency thing will be mm, helpful mm. uh, to solve this problem? I think there are two issues here. One is that uh, uh, collecting data in the physical environment is generally more difficult mm-hmm. uh, unlike it on the online platform. Right. So uh, in fact, if you look at, uh, let's say, a typical shopping mall, you could be you be, could be talking about 40, 400, 500 uh, different retailers. Mm. Right. And each one of them could have like 10 different uh, point of sales. So to collate all this into uh, a usable data format mm-hmm. is actually not so easy for the, in the physical space. Whereas uh, online, you may have uh, a million uh, different retailers. But then the, the, all the transactions could be aggregated in the flash of a second because of uh, the computing power that we now have access to. Mm. Mm. So, so mm. there is a difference between uh, physical space, collection of data in the physical space versus the collection of data in the online space. Mm. So that's number one. Number two, of, obviously, in, uh, in the traditionally, I think uh, most uh, merchants and retailers are still not used to the idea that they share some of the d- information mm. with a landlord who is supposedly on the other side of the table, right? But really, I think at the end of the day, it's a question of how the data is going to be used. Mm. Uh, how the data is going to be used. If the data is going to be used to promote the marketplace, to make it a more viable marketplace, make it a thriving marketplace, it's going to be for the benefits of all the retailers within that space. Yeah, but I think that's, that's very interesting that you talk about that, right? Because... Uh. I think it does seem that this data transparency or fair tendency may seem to some like a bit of a stick rather than a carrot. Like, oh, you know, legislation or mm-hmm. forces, no, rather uh, something other than market forces, forcing me to share data. Like, and then yeah. people kind of feel like, okay. oh, I'm, I'm losing out, right? But I think it's an interesting point, right? <coughs> that yeah. if we could actually use this data, not as a compliance tool, but actually to actually grow mm-hmm. the whole market, the whole ecosystem, I think that's a very interesting point. Mm. The other point that you brought up is that uh, it's not that the data is in doubt whether we can use it because you talked about using, mm. uh, making decisions with, with data, right? But I think it is about how do we call it data physically? I think that seems to be the challenge that has been holding back uh, this, yeah. this intake or this uptake of, of data use over the physical right, space right. over time. Uh, th- yes, th- yes, yes, yes. Yeah, There's definitely one uh, uh, practical issues to solve on the ground mm. uh, because you have so many point of sales that will be <laughs> yes. out there. And each one of them has got a different format yep. and mm. they may use a different systems. And some of these are maybe uh, the, the, uh, the, compared to the current generation, maybe 10 generations earlier than the current generations. Yeah. So some of these things are not easy to, uh, to manage, especially when you have different formats coming in from the different points of sales. There was a point you mentioned earlier, right? Like whether I trust my data will be used to 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 a, a positive effect, right? Like rather than mm. will it be used against me? Uh, and I think it's quite an interesting contradiction or contrast right now, where uh, if I'm a merchant, both physically and online, I would probably be sharing all my transactional data with one of the e-commerce marketplaces. Yes, but I would never mm. share it with my landlord. 
Mm. Right, so it, it's quite an interesting contrast, isn't okay. it? In, in terms of that data it is, stance, it is. yeah. It like, is. What, what what do we make of this, and how, how how could we change this? I think it is a it is a in a way is a bit of a mindset mm-hmm. that uh, because you are <laughs> in the past because of practical difficulties of collecting data in yes. the physical space, so we don't collect it on a, certainly not on a timely uh, uh, live basis. So, uh, but then when we started the online trading. Mm-hmm. Everybody is already online, and then uh, the data has already been collected from day one. So people just get used to it. So it's a matter of, I suppose, it's a issue of uh, the various traders and merchants getting used to some of these things, mm-hmm. uh, some of this sharing of the data. I think what is important is that uh, actually this data, uh, if we take one step back, for the retailer, the data is important for them to make assessment as mm. to how they can actually optimize mm. the performance of their stores, the different stores that they have, and uh, different outlets. And if they can couple that with uh, a better understanding of their customer, for example, through a loyalty program, mm. that will be even more powerful. That means they will allow them to then look across their whole network of uh, uh, stores to see how they can ch- switch the, or adjust the, the merchandise mix in order to better cater to their respective catch, catchment. Mm. So as a network, they can be actually a lot more effective. Mm. So mm. from the retailer's perspective, actually there are many things that they can do with the, the, the data. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it, if you take one step back and then look at it from the landlord perspective, actually landlords similarly, uh, they, they want the shopping mall to do well. Yeah. Right? Mm. There are many tenants within the shopping mall. How how do the different tenants sort of uh, interact with each other mm. to create a better so-called social and uh, physical experience uh, for the customers? It's, it's important to the, to the landlord in order to, for the malls to thrive. So they, they also collectively, I mean, it's difficult for individual tenants to do certain activities at the shopping mall level, but for the landlord to do it, actually, it's only natural. Mm. So they will have yes. to do it. So And when they do this, this, uh, some of these activities, knowing the customers and don't, knowing how the customers respond to each of these marketing activities mm. will be very, in fact, very uh, uh, helpful for the, the landlord to come up with even more effective promotion mm. or marketing mm. campaigns yep. in, uh, in the future. Mm. So, so if you put all these things together, actually, to the landlord, it is something that is useful to the mm-hmm. retailers. It's something something that is useful. Mm-hmm. So if you put the two together, in fact, you can then now look at it. Whether you, I mean, you will be in a much better position to create a, what we what I would call a thriving sort of a retail ecosystem. Yeah. I think, I think very interesting, right? Uh, Mian, you bring out these like the loyalty program uh, yeah. things, right? So I think uh, just now you also mentioned about like the data for online because when the people go online, they're already used to it. So they will share, like in, on default, they will share the data with the platform, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, offline, because when the thing started is very... Uh, they never started with sharing. Yes. So, right. so that's why there's, uh, it becomes a sort of a... Um, a practice not to share. Yes, and then yes. when, the, when they are so certain requests for sharing, this is where they get very uncomfortable. Mm. Understandably, understandably. Mm. So I think the issue then now is that how do we move forward from where we are today is really to think about, to build that trust between uh, multiple parties, between landlord and uh, tenants, between tenants and customers. Mm. And then the customers must, as, must at the same time also trust the, 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 the malls. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so at the end of the day, is these three different groups of uh, people yeah, yeah. getting together, trusting that they are de- whatever data that is collected will be anonymized and will be de- used in a very responsible manner. Essentially, like yeah. a retail yes. tripartite or holy it's trinity of perhaps, you need yeah. you need all three yeah. to to be comfortable to trust that the system can work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I think I think I think it seems like actually the loyalty program inside the mall will be like uh they will build the trust between the the, the three different uh party ah. and then also that mm. actually they can also help the landlord and help the merchant to provide a good user experience uh for the customers. It allows uh okay from the retailer perspective, uh some understanding of their customers mm. will allow them to personalize some of the services mm. or products or you know, certain things that they can do. They, if they know that the customer has a certain preferences, when they step into the store, they will know how they can actually uh, 
a better service, service this particular yeah. customer that comes in. So I think that's the from the retailer's perspective that, yes. that will work. I think from the landlord perspective, you want a, a tenant mix that will be responsive to these particular uh, customers. So the or your target audience uh, mm. that you want it to be responsive. Mm. And knowing who your customers are will allow you to then think about how you could curate a, a better so-called tenant mix that can cater for this target audience. Mm. You may say that, oh, if you curate a better tenant mix, means you've got to give out some retailers and then you bring in other retailers. I think from that pers perspective, it's not necessary. Uh, it's a difficult thing sometimes. But uh, if the, the tenant mix is such that they, they have a need for certain types of tenants, and certain types of tenants, for example, you need a certain mix of uh, F&B of certain type of food. Yeah then you want to consciously bring some of this in. But then if you are selling something totally different, mm. right, mm. it may not actually appeal to this particular group. And by being physically located in the, uh, th th that particular marketplace may not really help you in terms of your sales. Mm. So mm. some of these things are, again, this is where the data will be helpful, not just to the landlord, but also to the retailers to think about, okay, is this the right market that I want to site my store in? Mm -hmm. So if not, then the data will support, will allow me to better understand this particular catchment, this particular market, then I can make a decision to move somewhere else that yes. better fit yes. my brand profile and the retail format that I'm looking at. Yeah, that's a good yes. point to actually yeah. use that data to understand the profile, to understand yes. The, yes. The, the programming, the curation, the, 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 the assortment that we're yes. providing. And then from decision yeah. making on that both the retailer yes. and the, the marketplace yes. level. Uh, you mentioned about loyalty as well, right? And and. Um, I, I do understand that during your tenure uh, with Capital N, uh, it was quite a big uh, project of yours to push out this loyalty program, Capital Star. Mm. Um, uh, if, if I'm correct, if I understand correctly, right? Um, uh, but my question is, is it important, as important now, or even more important, let's say in the context of what's happening today mm. Uh, mm. With, with, with the crisis, with, with, with all these changes that are happening? Uh, where, where, where do loyalty programs stand? Where, where do we go from here? I think it is uh, is is even more important today. If you ask me, the reason really is because with uh, the pandemic, uh, there are a lot of restrictions on the trading in the physical space. Mm -hmm. So a number of retailers, in fact, we concluded. I think uh, a lot of people have concluded in the last six months, one year, that you need to be both online and offline. Yes. Uh, okay. So so uh, retailers has. Uh, a number of them uh, have in fact accelerated their pivot towards an online and offline uh, space. Mm -hmm. So for, for the landlord, it's a, it's a similar situation. They will need to pivot. They will need to allow and facilitate this online offline. And for, for landlord to be able to do that, really they need to understand who their customers are. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I mean, a loyalty program like Capital Star will allow the landlord to better understand who the, the profile of the customers that are going into the malls. And then mm. with that, they can actually share that information with the retailers. Mm. So the whole idea is to share that information and the, the, the insights with the retailers and to help the retailers to better understand the catchment. And uh, once you understand the catchment, you know the kind of profile of the customers who come into your shopping malls. Yep. Uh, you, you can adjust your merchandise mix to be more effective. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the customer's point of view, it, it meets your requ their requirement better. But at the same time, from the retailer's point of view, it means that they can actually sell better. Yes. Mm. And then, yeah. of course, value is created. Then, of course, the, 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 from the shopping mall perspective, they hope that if the retailers are doing well, they can actually get some share of the what we call the GTO or some share of the Exactly. Yep. The That's turnover. how everyone can win together. Ah, yeah. So mm. the most important thing is to create the value first. If you don't create value, we are actually trying to, sh to decide how much to get from a smaller pie. Mm. But if we can create that value, we have a mm. bigger pie, is a, we may get a proportionately smaller uh, percentage of that bigger pie, but then in absolute terms, it's actually bigger. Mm. So I think from that perspective, it's mm. a lot more that, that you can do with the data to allow the, both the, all the participants, like all the stakeholders in the retail ecosystem to benefit from it. Mm. This is very interesting because I think in our yeah. white paper for AI yeah. Amazing, we actually mentioned about mm. um, it's a bit like a game theory model, right? Like yes. It's like a lot of people are playing lose-lose right now and they're looking mm. at a smaller pie as opposed to really changing the paradigm and asking ourselves how could we play to win 
yes, all yeah, sides, yes. right? And um, I think the next question that we wanted to ask was really around like what your advice would be for, let's say, a retail chain. Yeah. Um, if, let's say, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. a retail chain boss will talk to you, okay, I, I'm, I'm in this situation now, uh, you're talking about data, you're talking about agreements, <laughs> Ming Yen, you know, like <laughs> on a practical level, what do I do now? I think they are, uh, first, I think they, they, I'm sure many of them are very knowledgeable in this area as well. Yes. So, uh, in fact, I have uh, spoken to many uh, retail, retail chain bosses. Uh, they have uh, got uh, many of the so-called the data on their fingertips. So they understand, okay, this is happening, that is happening and all this. Um, to what extent that is, uh, or they have that, that insights, lah. How that insight is derived? Is it based on intuition or based on uh, actual data that's been collected in the physical space as well as the online space? That one, I'm not too sure. Mm-hmm. But then my guess is that if they are making that decision, that intuition or that insights based on their intuition, then my, my key suggestion would be that if there's an opportunity for them to uh, collect some of this data, and then to get the insights from some of the data, it may some of the data may actually surprise the, the mm. conclusion may actually surprise them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so <laughs> it will be worth the while to to do so. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the last last question I will be like then what will be the advice for the more management, right? Because I think just now we bring mm-hmm. up like is we need to look into the biggest pie, not the smaller pie. Um, yeah. The landlord collecting the data is just not to calculate the GTO. It's actually want to really understand uh, what happening inside the mall, especially we bring the mm-hmm. loyalty program in, uh, want to try to understand the customer spending behavior. Yeah, yeah. Then using that data actually help back to the retailer. Mm-hmm. So then what, what will be your advice to the mall management? I think GTO is only the very first step. Yeah. I think mm-hmm. in the past, it's difficult to get all this uh, transaction data. So it's, uh, you have no choice, but then you look at it on the GTO, you get to see some of these numbers on a monthly basis. Uh, that is, uh, of course, short of nothing. That is, mm. that is probably mm. uh, the best you could do. Mm. But in today's context, actually, there's a possibility of really understanding, getting the data on the how do you call it, uh, on a live basis. So you know on the, even to the extent of hour, hour, hour by hour or minute by minute, how the mall is actually performing mm. on the transactions or activities within the mall. So knowing that, I think, uh, and coupled with the kind of uh, uh, promotion and marketing activities that you are carrying out, actually give you a lot of insights as to what actually your customers will respond to. And uh, this will allow you so then adjust your program, mm. uh, refine it so that it is better catered for your target audience. Okay. Mm. So I think we've really come to the end. I we stretch <laughs> beyond 20 minutes actually. Yeah. And um, we do have one last question. The last question that we we'll ask you and every other guest is, do you think retail will always be king? And why? Retail is always king. I mean, uh, well, people like to, I think marketplace has always been there all the while. Yeah. And the marketplace mm-hmm. is always made out of buyers and sellers, right? Buyers and sellers. And so you have, uh, in the old days, is your in the format of your web market, your bazaar and all that. But in today's context, it's more shopping mall. Yeah. And then to, uh, after, in the more recent years, it is online shopping malls. Mm. And I think going forward really is about a mix of online, offline, omni channels that will be happening in the space so it will take different forms but yes all these uh, transactional activities people buy and sell in order to to generate uh, uh, to to satisfy their own consumption needs uh, Mm. will always be there so we will just have to make sure that we if you are a retailer to keep up with uh, what is happening in that space if you are more owner always think about how you can make your space a lot more interesting for the consumer Mm. Yep. And I think with that, uh, that is it. Thank you so much, Ming Yang, for coming today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah. Yep. How will retail change post pandemic? Download the future of retail white paper from our website, aiamazing.co.